Hello, folks. This is Pastor Mike Hoggard coming to you from Watchman Studios with another Watchman video broadcast. We are in Matthew chapter 24. We are also in Mark chapter 13. Uh, this week, Luke doesn't have a whole lot to say concerning uh, we're dealing with the day, the event that's going to take place. The sun is dark and the moon, uh, depending on what verse you're reading, is either darkened or turned to blood. Um, the stars of heaven are going to fall. The heavens are going to be shaken and so on. We're dealing with that day. And Luke really doesn't, even though it's part of the synoptic gospel, doesn't say a whole lot other than there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and, and so on. So let's just, we're going to stick with Matthew 24. We'll look at Mark chapter 13, how he says it and so on. But let's get right into it because we're going to be, we're going to be dealing with the issue of the moon. And it's going to take a few of these broadcasts to really lay this out the way I think you, I mean, you know me, as long as, as long as God has left us here on this earth, why don't we spend the time just studying the Bible, studying the scripture? It's like eating chicken. Just make sure you get every piece of meat you can off of that, off of that bone. Don't leave anything left. All right. And that's what we're doing as far as the word of God is concerned. Matthew 24, verse 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days, shall the sun be darkened, we dealt with that last, and the moon shall not give her light. Notice the language. The moon shall not give her light. And the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man. Well, I can't wait till we deal with that. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. And they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet. And they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Now, here's how Mark says it. In Mark chapter 13, verse 24, but in those days, after that tribulation, and let me just stop right here. Again, not going to rehash uh, the videos that we did on the days of tribulation, but, uh, and, and I've talked to at least one person on the phone responded to the issue of, can you show me a seven-year period called tribu the Great Tribulation or Tribulation or things like that. And, you know, the, the conversation between two Christians, two people who believe the Bible, respectful in both ways, but there was nothing really that, that changed my mind because I still have not seen the Scriptures that tells us specifically that there is a seven year long period called the Great Tribulation. I cannot find that in the scripture. If I can't find it in the scripture, I can't preach it. Okay? We are to preach the word of God alone. And that's what I'm attempting to do. So he said, this is the why Mark said what he said in those days after that tribulation. So I'm not sure how long that lasts, but I believe it's days rather than years. The sun shall be darkened and the moon, again, notice the language. The moon shall not give her light. We look back at Matthew. The moon shall not give her light. Mark says it again. The moon shall not give her light. And the stars of heaven shall fall, and the powers that are in heaven shall be shaken. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with power and glory. And then shall he send his angels, and shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from the uttermost part of the earth to the uttermost part of the heaven. Um, I did a uh, teaching several years ago 
called The Gathering. And if you wanted to look at that, I'll probably, I'll probably just uh, redo that as part of this Matthew 24 study, because I think that at that time, two gatherings are going to take place. Think of the story of the wheat and the tares. You have the gathering of fir first, the tares are gathered together first. That is very specific in what Jesus said. And then the wheat is taken and stored, uh, you know, with the heavenly father. And so uh, look, if you want to sort of do a study, do your own study on things that are gathered in the Bible, but I have also done a teaching on this. You can find it on YouTube. You can find it on our sermon audio page, sermonaudio.com slash Bethel, B-E-T-H-E-L. You should be able to find it both of those places. But here's what I want to start out with today. This issue of what is called the, the, the blood moon or the, the red moon, so on and so on. And I asked the question um, a while back in one of our church services. I said, does the Bible say that the, the moon is going to turn red? And several people responded in the positive, yes, the Bible says that. And, you know, I wasn't trying to be mean, but I said, actually, it doesn't. It tells us two things. And we're not going to really study that part of it today. But it says that it's not going to give her light or it shall be turned to blood. Now, the reason why I'm bringing all this up is I've seen a red moon before. And I remember the first time I did, I, I was a teenager, and I've always been fascinated with the, the moon, the stars. Um, I, I, I love, I, of course, I'm a child of the 60s and 70s during the rocket age, the astronaut ages, so on, space shuttle. I mean, those guys were my heroes, right? So anything going on up in the sky, I, w I wanted to know about. And I asked my parents one summer when I was about maybe 14, 15, something like that, there was going to be a lunar eclipse. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. And I I'd never seen one. And I asked them permission to stay up and stay outside and watch this thing. And I was amazed at what I saw. The moon turning literally the color red and i'm just fascinated and then you could see slowly at, you know the the earth blocking the rays of the sun uh from reaching the moon surface which the flat earth people if you're a flat earth person you might as well shut this off because i'm just going to aggravate you anyway on this but anyway that was just fascinating to me to see this red moon and then all of a sudden, you can see that it's totally eclipsed. The earth has gotten between the sun and the moon and darkened the moon. And then after that, of course, you know, the, the movements and of everything, the moon turns back to its natural. And it was a full moon. So you got to see the entirety of it. That just fascinated me as a young person. And of course, we've had since that time, several other what they call red moons. And it is a common occurrence. It is a lunar eclipse is what they call it. It's different from a solar eclipse. And we'll look at the difference. Now, the reason why I'm bringing all this up, let's take a look up on the screen. Do you, do you remember this? New York Times, best selling author, John Hagee. Four blood moons. Something is about to change. Remember that? That was what? About, well, let's see. I've got dates for it. John Hagee got involved in it. Some lady named, well, we'll just say Diane. The four blood moons. Bible prophecies fulfilled. Blog series. Here's another one. Four blood moons. 
and it lists, you know, Passover 2014, the Feast of Sukkoth 2014, uh, 2015, again 2015, another one in 2015, and it quotes scripture, the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming and great and terrible day of the Lord. Books written, Mark Hitchcock, Blood Moons Rising, Mark Biltz, Hebrew Roots, to the core Hebrew Roots, one of these law keepers, I, I go to church only on Saturday, therefore I'm better than everybody else, and we just don't have the sins that everybody, that, that law keeping stuff just does, doesn't go with me at all. But you remember that, right? And I actually had someone, a, a relative, who had, I guess, maybe read one of the books or had seen the information on the internet. A lot of YouTube videos about the four blood moons. A lot of, I'll, I'll say it this way, a lot of money changed hands on the four blood moons. And if you don't remember, basically it went like this. There was a string, a, a series of lunar eclipses, which because of the sun's light passing through the Earth's atmosphere, and the Earth's atmosphere has dirt in it, dust particles, and so on and so on, then it alters the light coming from the sun that's reflecting off the moon's surface. It alters the color of that light and it changes the color of the moon. And so there was an, uh, a time back 2014, 2015, where there was a, su a succession of lunar eclipses that, you know, I admit it was rather interesting because it's, it's, not an everyday occurrence. It doesn't happen every month. It doesn't happen every year. But here you have four of them in a row. Now, you have all of these people coming unglued over the four blood moons. Have you seen the four blood moons thing? Pastor Mike, what do you think about the four blood moon thing? I mean, is that going to be the start of the Great Tribulation? The rapture, the rapture is going to be... And a family member asked me about it, and I gave an honest answer. I said, I don't buy it. I don't believe it for a second. I don't believe the claims. I don't, um, I don't believe that the Bible says anything about a succession of four lunar eclipses, red moons, I don't see the Bible saying anything about that whatsoever. And I said that it, they're, they're using the scripture, like here uh, um, on this particular graphic, the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming and great and terrible day of the Lord while they were making an issue and a lot of money dealing with these four lunar eclipses, they were forgetting this idea that also the sun had to be darkened as well, which then when the sun is darkened, back in 2017, we were fortunate here in Festus, Missouri, that and other places in Missouri, that the 2017 solar eclipse took place right over us. Absolutely fascinating to watch. Uh, I, re I remember standing out there and actually hearing then, th you know, the crickets start chirping and things like that because they think it's night. And then all of a sudden it's daylight again. You could feel a difference in the temperature because it was in the summer. And, and I, mean, I mean, I just love things like that. Didn't miss it at all. Fascinated by that stuff. So here's the thing. We know what, let me put this graphic up on the screen. This is what causes the moon 
to turn red, a lunar eclipse, in that the, the Earth, at a particular time, gets in the way between the sunlight reflecting off the moon's surface. See the word umbra and penumbra. Umbra, you, you've heard of an umbrella, haven't you? Okay, an umbra means a shadow. A penumbra means almost a shadow or close to a shadow. So you can, you can be in a place where you can have a total lunar eclipse where the sun is, com or the, excuse me, where the moon is completely blocked and you'll see it turn red before that. Then it's blocked out by the shadow of the, of the, of the earth, the ball, the globe of the earth. Um, and then it'll, then it'll start brightening up again and so on. Or some people live in an area where they only see the penumbra. They see the moon changing colors, but they're not in a place where they can see the, the total eclipse and so on. So when you have a lunar eclipse, the sun has to be shining in order to have that. The sun is shining, but the earth gets in the way between the sun and the moon. When you have a solar eclipse, and this I love, and, you know, and I watch, you know, a lot of videos about aliens and UFOs and things like, and, and the current thinking now, this to me is hilarious, by a lot of the UFO people is, for some reason, it seems like the moon was deliberately created. <laughs> yeah. Some, some of these, you know, these ancient alien guys and so on, they're even saying that the moon is like this big spaceship. It's hollow. It's probably got people living in it. It's full of machinery, whatever, because of the fact that our moon is unique, totally unique in just in our solar system. There is, there are other planets that have moons. As far as I know, we're the only one that has a perfectly round moon. Not only that, we're the only planet in the solar system that can have a total solar eclipse where you can see the corona, which means crown, around the, the blackened sun. You can see the corona around it because the moon is, let's see if I can remember how this, how they did this. The sun is 400 times the size of the moon. And the moon, the distance between the moon and the sun is like 400 times the, whatever. But for some, what I'm saying is, this is awful. The moon is 400, the sun is 400 times the size of the moon and the distance of the moon between the earth and the sun is so exact and precise that it gives us the opportunity to see a total solar eclipse with the little crown around it. You can tell the sun's there because it's this circle of light and fire coming out of it. There's no other planet in our solar system that has that. And the UFO people, the ancient alien people, they're like going, it seems like the moon was deliberately placed there in that particular spot. Of course it was. On day four of creation, God created a greater light to rule the day and 
the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. And they're theorizing, you know, maybe something smashed into the earth and broke a piece of the earth off, and that was the Pacific Ocean now, and the, the moon is a chunk of the earth. But once we got to the moon and started pulling rocks and stuff off of it, we're going, well, it doesn't really match anything that's here on this earth, so we know it didn't happen that way. This is what you do when you forget about the Bible and you don't believe in creation, is that you come up with all kinds of theories that will always be wrong. Like John Hagee, Mark Biltz, March, Mark Hitchcock, Diane, I won't, I won't say her name, and hundreds, maybe thousands of others. YouTube videos, books, blogs, you name it. Millions of dollars were made lying to people. Because the idea was, these four blood moons are fulfilling Bible prophecy, and God is going to do amazing things with the nation of Israel as these four blood moons or these four red moons take place. Nothing happened. Nothing. There was no war in Israel. There was, there was no atomic blast. The tribulation didn't start. This, Jesus didn't start unsealing the book. Nothing happened other than a lot of people made a ton of money with books and DVDs and, and blogs and YouTube videos and whatnot. And they all lied through their teeth. You see, because there's something that God doesn't like. And I can remember back when God first called me into studying Bible prophecy, 1997, November 1997, that immediately I went looking for the day and the hour. I mean, why not, right? And after a while, God finally said, Mike, stop. The day and the hour, you know the scripture, the day and the hour is in my hand. And I'll do it when I'm ready to do it. I will reveal it when I'm ready to reveal it. So don't worry about that. Let me teach you some other things. And from that point forward, I stopped calculating, I stopped counting days, I, I stopped whatever, trying to figure out the day and the hour of the Lord's coming. And what a lot of people are doing, especially with this blood moon thing, they were actually doing something that God said, I don't want you doing. Observing times. Leviticus 19.26, you shall not eat anything with the blood, neither shall you use enchantment, nor observe times. And if you go back, let's look at this graphic again. You see how they did it, these four blood moons? Well, this one's going to happen on Passover, 2014. This one's going to happen on Sukkoth, 2014. This one's going to happen the first of Nisan, 2015. This one's going to happen on Passover, 2015. This one's going to happen on Sukkoth, 2015. See, what they were doing was they were observing times. They were looking at, oh, this sign is going to take place. Therefore, God is going to do something on that day. They were, they were trying to guess God and when he was going to do something. And let me ask you a question. Did anybody, did any body predict the date of Christ's birth anywhere that you can see in the Old Testament? No. In fact, the only person who really knew that Jesus was coming before anybody else was John the Baptist. And it's because Mary went to Elizabeth, his mother, and told her, you know, I'm with child, and we, we know that story. So John then introduces Jesus as the Messiah. 
But before that, no, nobody, there's no record anywhere in the Old Testament that I or anybody else that I know of or have ever read has ever found the exact date of birth of Jesus Christ from the Old Testament. It's not there. What you have are people doing exactly what God said don't do. They're observing times. Look at Deuteronomy 18. These are the things now, there's nine things that God told the Israelites, don't do this. He said, there shall not be found among you any one that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire, or that useth divination, or an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch, or a charmer, or a consulter with familiar spirits, or a wizard, or a necromancer. For all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord. Because of these abominations, the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee. Thou shalt be perfect with the Lord thy God for these nations which thou shalt possess. Hark, look, look at what they did. They hearkened unto observers of times and unto diviners. But as for thee, the Lord thy God hath not suffered thee so to do. And that is precisely what the, all of the people with the, with the four red moon theories had was they were looking back in history and I don't even think they were being historically accurate. They were trying to fold history around certain uh, lunar eclipses. Well, a lunar eclipse happened in such and such a date. Well, you know, like three years after that, something bad happened in Israel. That's a stretch. They made this stuff up and they were using the observation of times in order to do it. They were trying to figure out now when the sun does this and the moon does this and these stars do this, then God's going to do this. And I know there's going to be signs and wonders up there. But as far as looking up to the moon and the sun and the stars to try to figure out when the rapture is going to happen or the great tribulation is going to start or the seven year peace deal with the, you know, the, all that stuff that they dream up, it's observing of times. And God said, don't do it. He said, these nations which thou shalt possess hearkened unto observers of times and unto diviners, divination is practically the same thing. But as for thee, the Lord thy God hath not suffered thee so to do. God said, I'm, I'm not allowing you to do that. Don't, don't do it. Don't worry about the day, the hour, the year, the moon here, the sun there, the stars. God said, don't worry about it. I have my plan. I'll do what I want to do. And if I want to tell you, I will tell you. But God said, don't be an observer of times, which basically is astrology. Galatians chapter four. Paul, now Paul was using this illustration. You know, we know what Galatians is about. Galatians is about do the Gentiles keep the law? Well, the big secret is the Jews never did. So why should they demand that the Gentiles keep the law when the Jews never kept the law? So Paul, sure enough, he warned everybody in Acts. He said, after my departure, grievous wolves shall come in. And that's exactly what happened. Every church he started, when he left, wolves moved in. And the Galatian churches, in that case, they were what some scholars call the Judaizers. They were telling people, they were basically the uh, first century version of the Hebrew roots people. Mark Biltz. Um, what are some of these others? Uh, the guy that I can't remember, the guy that was in prison. Anyway, you know these Hebrew roots people who are telling everybody we must have, we must have. He practically said it in a YouTube video. I believe when we observe times on Yahweh's calendar that God blesses that. And God said, don't observe times. Here's what Paul said, Galatians 4, 9. But now, after that ye have known God, or rather are known of God, 
How turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements whereunto ye desire again to be in bondage? Ye observe days and months and times and years. Count those things. One, two, three, four. Gospel replacement. And see, on this part, I'm going to preach to myself because I was guilty. God blessed me when he called me into this ministry and he started showing me these beautiful, amazing things from the Bible. Somebody called the other day, really cheered me up. Said, Pastor, do you know how I got saved? I was watching Jesus Christ DNA in the Holy Bible. And she said, I asked Jesus into my heart after watching that video. That just blessed me. You observe days and months and times and years. Now count those, days, months, times, years. What do we have? A replacement gospel. Paul said you're going after the weak and beggarly elements. Now that you know God, now you're going back to something that's way less than that. And I, as I said earlier, God called me 1997, November, into this ministry. And from 97, 98, 99, 2000, 2001, 2000. I mean, God is just showing me these amazing things. A lady calls the other day cheers me up, said, Pastor, you, do you know how I got saved? I was watching Jesus Christ DNA in the Holy Bible, and I asked Jesus into my heart, went out and bought a King James Bible. That blessed my heart because I, God led me to make that video sort of as an, an evangelism tool. It's like, look at how amazing this Bible is laid out, and it can't be an accident. There has to be a God, there, and, and if there is a God, then there is a Savior, there's sin, there's hell, there's heaven. And there's no doubt that other people have been saved. So during those years, I mean, I just can't read the Bible enough, right? Then I get into this thing where I'm looking at the internet all the time. I'm looking at what's going on politically. I'm looking at what's going on here. I'm reading the news and fake news, right wing news. What I did was, after having seen these amazing things in the King James Bible, I started turning back to the weak and beggarly elements by turning away from the Word of God and trying to get information off the Internet. That turned out wasn't true. I did it. I neglected my study, my love, my reverence. Like Paul said in Ephesians, you lost your first love. And now God has brought that back to me and I don't want to walk away from this Bible ever again. So why, why, after having read the Bible and God showing you something in doodads going up and down your back and tears coming to your eyes and you're looking at this Bible going, this Bible is amazing. Why would you, would you turn again to weak and beggarly elements? But in this case, Paul says, you observe days and months and times and years. And by the way, that's what witches do. It's a form of witchcraft. Colossians 2.16, let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. And I've known people, we go to church on the Sabbath. We're God's special people. How come you don't go to church on the Sabbath? You see, Paul was right. When people think that they're saved by their works, they always boast about it. And back here in Colossians, Paul is telling us, don't let anybody judge you on that stuff. So what if you didn't, so what if you didn't have Passover? We've already had the fulfillment of Passover. We have Passover every time we read our Bibles. We have the unleavened bread of truth, which is the word of God. So after having been given this, 
Why did we, why did we turn away from it to go chase down other things that eventually we found out weren't true? And see, here's the thing. This, the people who wrote these books after nothing happened have not written another book saying why I was wrong about the four red moons. None of them have done that. They won't apologize. They never will. God also says this, Isaiah 47, 13, Thou art wearied in the multitude of thy counsels, let now the astrologers, the stargazers, the monthly prognosticators stand up and save thee from these things that shall come upon thee. Yes, it's basically astrology. When these people started looking at these lunar eclipses and then saying, God is going to do something with Israel at that time, be ready because the rapture could could take place at that time. We're not setting dates. However, we are making a ton of money. They're basically using astrology. And astrology, God told them. He said, when you get into the land, Deuteronomy, he said, when you get into the land, you see the sun, the moon, and the stars. Don't worship those and serve them, which means you believe that the positions of the sun, the moon, and the stars on certain days are going to determine what God is going to do? Really? God never says anything like that. He's going to do what he's going to do on the day that he's going to do it. He knows that day. He's not told us that day. And why don't we just let that go. People ask me, How, Pastor, do you think the rapture is coming soon? Don't know. I don't know. While we're here, we still have work to do. Let's get to it. Daniel chapter 2. Nebuchadnezzar, at this time, a lost man, figured it out that the astrologers that he had were more than likely lying through their teeth. Look at what he said. And in the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar dreamed dreams wherewith his spirit was troubled and his sleep break from him. Then the king commanded to call the magicians and the astrologers and the sorcerers and the Chaldeans. Again, one, two, three, four, magicians, astrologers, sorcerers, Chaldeans. For to show the king his dreams. So they came and stood before the king. And we, we skip down to what Nebuchadnezzar said. But if you will not make known unto me, this is verse 9, the dream, there is but one decree for you, for you have prepared lying and corrupt words to speak before me till the time be changed. Therefore tell me the dream, and I shall know that you can show me the interpretation thereof. Nebuchadnezzar figured it out. He, he was no dummy. He may have been full of pride, but he wasn't stupid. Because he said, if you guys, you astrologers, you're looking at the moon and the stars and where they are all the time, and you're telling me that this and this is going to happen because this moon is going to do this on this day. If you can't tell me the dream, then I'll know that you've been lying to me all this time. And I'll... I'm going to cut your head off. Daniel, and I love this. You have the magicians, astrologers, sorcerers, Chaldeans. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. It's always a battle, people, over the gospel and over the truth. These four prayed. And out of these four, one of them's different. Which one is it? Daniel, because he's the one that God gave to him not only the dream, but the interpretation of it. And Daniel made sure to say, as for this dream, God didn't give it to me because I'm more special than anybody else. But he had to give it to somebody just so that it could be known what is going to happen in the end. How it's all going to turn out. 
did Daniel, did he, did, he, at, did he look to the moon? Did he measure the moon? Did he, did, he, did he do any star forecasting in order to get what that dream was? No. He just prayed and God showed it to him. When Daniel was distressed in Daniel 9, and I brought this up in the tribulation series, when Daniel was distressed about being in Babylon, wanting to know how long they were going to be there, did he, did he look at the stars? Did he measure the moon? Did he look for solar eclipses and lunar eclipses? And did he do any of that? No, he read Jeremiah. He read the Bible and found out we're going to be here 70 years, 70 years. And they were there how long? 70 years. You see what I'm getting at? And it's not just the four red moon people that are guilty. A lot of people are guilty. They're looking at feast days. They're looking at, at the sun, the moon, the stars, and how they're going to line up. On I remember back years ago, what was it, 82? All of the planets were basically on the same. Their rotations had brought them basically all on the same side of the sun along with the earth, and that was supposed to bring in the new world order. That was supposed to bring in the Antichrist. The rapture was going to happen that day. People were doing it. They've been doing it for years. And God says, just knock it off. If you want to know, why don't you just ask me and then read the scriptures, do what Daniel did. Because after he read the 70 years, he went, okay, we'll be here 70 years. And he had no doubts in his mind whatsoever. Now, now that I've dealt with that, I kept, as we were reading Matthew 24 and Mark 13, I want you to notice what I had underlined. The moon shall not give her light. That's Matthew 24, Mark 13 again. The moon shall not give her light. Now, we saw last week, we saw last week how the sun represents who? The bridegroom. Jesus Christ. Now, now think about it. Okay? Um, he's, the sun is always regarded as a he. And in the scriptures, the moon is always represented as her. A female. There's probably a zillion reasons why, but let's look at it. Isaiah 13. For the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light, stars and constellations there, that's sort of generic. The sun shall be darkened in his going forth and the moon shall not cause her light to shine. Ezekiel 32, 7. And when, it, when I shall put thee out, I will cover the heaven and make the stars thereof dark, I will cover the sun with a cloud, and the moon shall not give her light. Matthew 24, 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light. Mark 13, but in those days after that tribulation, the sun shall be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light. Revelation 12, 1, there appeared a great wonder in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of 12 stars. Now, I bring this woman now into the picture for a reason, and I'm going to show you the reason in, in a little bit. But all through the scripture, the sun is always masculine. The moon, always feminine, her. Now, the moon shines, shines very bright, especially on a full moon. But where does the moon get her light? And that's what I was, 
trying to show you earlier the point I was making when people were asking me about this four blood moon thing, you know, is it really going to, I said that if the sun is darkened, you can't have a lunar eclipse and a solar eclipse on the same day at the same time. It can't happen because in order for the moon to turn the color red, the sun has to be shining through the earth's atmosphere to change the light waves or however that is like a prism. And that's what gives it its color. So they left that out of their prophecies deliberately because it didn't make sense. On the day that Christ is talking about, the moon not only is not going to give her light or turn to blood, but the sun also is darkened as well. So where is it that we know that the moon gets her light from El Sol, the sun. You like my Spanish? I learned that one. Um, Matthew chapter 5, watch this. Jesus said, ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Now, hang on a second. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. But now he's saying, ye, as the church, the bride. Remember the bridegroom in, Revel in uh, Psalm 19, he comes running as a, you know, as a mighty man for a race. And, you know, the son, he's, a, he's the bridegroom, right? Who is his bride? It's the church. It's his saints. It's his people. Where do we get our light from anyway? Do we generate it ourselves? No. We get our light the exact same way that the moon gets her light. She gets it from the sun. Okay? So that's why he said, you're the light of the world picture of the church. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. John 1 verse 6, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to, to do what? To bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Notice in this passage, one, two, three, four. The word light, capitalized, capital L, four times. I mean, I love this stuff. The Bible's in perfect order. But look at what John is saying. John said, I'm not that light. I've come to bear witness of that light. Now, if you didn't hear, and think about this. If you didn't hear from Jesus directly speaking directly face to face to you, then how did you know John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Where did you get that verse from if you didn't hear it directly from the mouth of Jesus Christ himself? You got it from someone who is born again, who believes the Bible and is passing on the light that they have been given themselves. See it? John 8, 12. Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. See it now? Jesus is the light of the world. Matthew 5, 14. Ye are the light of the world. We are. But so is he. Okay, Jesus saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. And again, and the, the flat earth people, again, I'm going to aggravate you again. They've made up so many lies 
it just staggers my mind because they, they just can't handle truth. But they insist that the moon has its own light source. The moon does not get its light from the sun. Well, it's called a telescope. A pair of binoculars will work too. Or just go out and look at it. You can clearly see that when the moon is not full, you can see that there is a curvature on it and a shadow there. And you can tell that that part that normally would be lit is not lit. Why? Because it hasn't gotten to the point where that part can be lit by the sun. There's only one source of light in this solar system. And it's Jesus Christ, the light. We are the reflection of that light. Let me keep reading. John 12, 36, while you have light, believe in the light that you may be the children of light. These things spake Jesus and departed and did hide himself from them. John 12, 46, I am come a light into the world that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. Romans 13, 12, the night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on, what? The armor of light. Remember that verse we looked at last week? where it says the Lord is a sun and a shield. He's both, right? And the sun actually is a shield for this earth because of its gravitational pull. It helps protect the earth from getting bombarded with these meteorites. So does the moon. When we finally, Apollo 8, when we finally got to the moon, Apollo 8 didn't land on the moon, but it went around it. And they saw the backside of the moon, and they went, whoa! It doesn't look like the front side at all. I mean, yeah, on the front side, there's a bunch of craters. The back side is full of craters. Why? Because the back side of the moon was a shield to the earth. These rocks flying through space hitting the moon instead of smashing into the earth. Mm -mm -mm. Let us put on the armor of light. Our own light? No, we don't have any. We have to get our light from the true light of the world, the word of God, Jesus Christ. In the case of the moon, the moon doesn't have her own light. She gets it from the sun. 2 Corinthians 4, 6, For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So do you, you see how that works now? God commanded the light to shine out of the darkness. That's a reference to Genesis 1. Let there be light, and there was light. And then later on, God said, let's make a greater light for the day and a lesser light for the night. So the light, according to 2 Corinthians 4, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So the face of Jesus Christ is the sun, right? That light shines in us so that it can come out out of us to go to other people. What am I doing right now? I'm trying to give you light, but not my light. My light's nuts. The light of the gospel, the truth of the word of God. I'm only giving you the light that God has given me, which is 
why it's so important for me to be in this book. I can't give you what I myself don't have, which is why I didn't write a book on the four red moon deal because I knew it wasn't in the Bible. Mm. Take a look at this one. 2 Corinthians 3.18, But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Now let me tell you, what that means in, in relation to what we're talking about. We all, with open face, beholding as in a glass. He's referring to a mirror, right? And the, remember whose image we're made in. God's image. So we look in a mirror, and what we're doing is we're beholding the opposite of ourselves. Christ is immortal, we're mortal. Christ is God, we're not. Christ is sinless, we're sinful. You see what I'm saying? In a mirror, when you raise your right hand in a mirror, the guy in the mirror is raising what hand? His left hand. It's kind of weird, isn't it? But now think about it. But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. You know what they, you know, everybody, for thousands of years, everybody said, I wonder what that moon's made of. Oh, it's made of cheese. You know what we found out when we finally landed Apollo 11? The, the fact, and I'm a... You know, I'm a student of this. This is one of my hobbies that I like to do. Um, when Neil Armstrong, after he said, this is, you know, one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Right after he set the camera up with Buzz Aldrin still inside Apollo 11, Neil Armstrong grabs, starts grabbing chunks. It's called contingency samples. He's grabbing chunks of rocks and dust and sho shoving them in these pockets that he has in his uniform. And Buzz is telling him, uh, you didn't quite get it in there, in case something happened and they had to hurry up and get off the surface of the moon. They didn't want to leave the surface of the moon without something to show for it. Okay, we're going to spend all this money to get you there we at least want a piece of, of it so we can look at it and see what it is. That is the first thing he did. It was the first thing on the, on the list. Once he set the, the outside camera up was he got a contingency sample. And then he was filming Buzz Aldrin coming down the ladder and stepping off on the moon and so on. But here's my point on this. Do you know what they figured out about the surface of the moon? What it's covered with? Glass. Glass. The bombardment of all of these meteors impacting the moon, the pressure and the heat from that impact instantly turning the particles of whatever meteor hit the moon and whatever's on the moon, turning it into glass. That's what happens. And whenever you find natural glass in the earth somewhere, it's the product of high heat somehow, some way. And the reason why the moon shines so bright as it does is because it's made glass. The moon is a reflection of, the, of her creator, Jesus 
Christ. Just as we are. Right now, all we are is the reflection of the light of Jesus Christ. But according to this and other verses, one of these days we're going to be changed into that same image from glory to glory. Remember, uh, I probably won't be able to find it very quickly. Remember when Paul in, I can't remember if it's 1 Corinthians or 2 Corinthians, he was talking about Moses and how his face came, you know, his face shone so bright that they had to put a veil. And Paul said there's, there's a veil over the Jews every time they read the Old Testament. And he said, if the ministration of death was glorious, so glorious that Moses' face had to be covered, how much more the ministration of life in the New Testament be much more glorious? That's what he means here when he says, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. That you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world, Right now, we have glory shining in this world. Even though we are sinful, we have the true light given to us in the face of Jesus Christ, reflecting off, off of us, reflecting out of us, reflecting through us, coming out of coming out of the deeds that we do, the things that we say, the life that we live, everything that we do manifests the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. But only Jesus can manifest the way it, the light really is supposed to be. We're the lesser light. He's the greater light. But one of these days, when we're looking in the mirror, beholding as in a glass, the glory of the Lord, we're going to be changed into that image one of these days. Some days I wish that day would come sooner than later. And I believe it will. When the Lord sends his angels after the tribulation of those days to gather us all together and to transform and change us just as Jesus was transformed the Mount of Transfiguration in Matthew chapter 17. His face shining like the sun. But for now, we reflect the light that Jesus has given us through his word. Let's be that light to this lost. The people who walk in darkness, and you know as well as I do, if you're going to take a walk at night, the best time to do it, full moon. You can almost read a book in a full moon. And that's the moon shining in her strength with the reflection of the light coming to, to her from her creator. That's what I believe. Now, next week, we're going to go a little bit farther into this. And remember, just like with the darkening of the sun, it's like God hiding his face, right? Well, if the darkening of the sun is God hiding his face, the moon turning to blood or the moon being darkened as well. What does that say for us being lights in a very dark world? I think it means that God is going to shut off at that day, at that time, 
preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ from his church. Could be wrong. Could be wrong about a lot of this. But I think that's what's going to happen. We'll see. Thank you for abiding with us. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for the love that you have for our ministry, for me, for your prayers. Pray for the people of Kenya. Pray for the people of Turkana, Samburu, all the places we minister. We're planning on going there, ministering at some point. We don't know when, but we are planning a trip to go back there to minister again to those wonderful people. Pray that God will bless what we believe that God has given us to do, and that is to put that permanent place of feeding for those people in Turkana. If God's in it, God will bless it. But help us pray about that. God bless you. You're the reason we do what we do. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.